Hi, in this video we're going to be talking a little bit about the history and culture of ancient Israel. This is going to be a quick summary of a very large topic. So when we talk about the history and culture of ancient Israel, one of the, one of the tools that helps us reconstruct that history is archaeology or digging into the digging into the ground to see the past, how people lived, what they, uh, uh, kinds of tools they used, what they, what they did in their daily lives, that sort of thing. Archaeology um, has great promise, but it also has uh, some limits. Um, one of the major limits it has uh, to, to a lot of people's dismay is it, is it cannot really prove the Bible. It cannot really disprove the Bible either, but the, uh, m mostly what it can do is give us a little bit different kind of picture that we, than we get in the written uh, texts, the written materials that uh, have been uh, preserved for us uh, in the Bible. Uh, so uh, when we look at archaeology, we discover uh, one of the main things is that uh, Israel went through a kind of development in its uh, understanding of God. Israel came into being through in a in a polytheistic environment. Polytheism means the uh, recognition that there are uh, many many gods, and uh, the uh, the largest or or main uh, polytheistic society in the world today is is in India. And uh, the polytheism gradually gave way to a, um, an understanding called henotheism. There's two different ways to say the word one in Greek. These, these words are uh, from Greek. Henotheism uh, describes a situation where uh, each nation worshipped one god, but allowed in their understanding allowed for the existence of, of other gods. So, uh, so for example, Israel worshipped the god they call Yahweh, but Moab worshipped a god they call uh, Chemosh. And uh, uh, again, as the centuries moved on, uh, uh, particularly when we get into the time of the Babylonian exile, Babylonian captivity and the years after that, the great Israelite prophets, uh, so-called Second Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel in particular, uh, emphasized the idea that Israel's God is not just Israel's God, but is really the God of the of the entire world. And uh, this this had significant impl implications for. Uh, for how we, how we talked about God and how we talked or how they talked about uh, culture and living under God and and even how they talked about uh, who God was concerned about you know was God concerned only about Israel as the majority of you uh, believed or was God concerned maybe about some of the other nations of the world like uh, the book of book of Jonah discusses discusses how uh, God might be concerned even for the evil uh, people in Nineveh. And uh, just a, a few uh, pictures to, uh, to show you, some things uh, where Israel is, is mentioned th throughout, its, uh, uh, throughout its history. And uh, these, uh, these documents or these, uh, these inscriptions mainly give, uh, give extra evidence outside the Bible for the for the existence of Israel and for, for Israel's place uh, in the world. Israel uh, came into being right around the time that, that iron began to be used as, a, uh, as the primary tool in, uh, in weapons and uh, utensils and things like that. Uh, uh, it wasn't so much a matter of uh, on, a, on a Tuesday they stopped using bronze and everybody uses iron. But it was it was a gradual transition, but it was right around this time that that Israel came to be, and uh, 
this first uh, picture is one of the, it's called the Merneptah Sela. It's one of the, or it's the actually the first mention of, of Israel as a defined uh, ethnic group outside of the Bible. This comes from uh, Pharaoh Merneptah, who, was, uh, who reigned uh, toward the end of the 13th century uh, BC. And uh, this, uh, this slab here, he uh, describes a, a military victory, a military campaign that he had taken in Syria, Palestine. And uh, among the other places that he, um, he boasts of destroying is Israel. He says, Israel is laid waste, his seed is no more. He gives the idea that he's completely destroyed Israel, that there's never again going to be any Israel or any people called Israel. Of course, this wasn't quite true. You know, this is just how uh, people talked about defeating other armies. When they, when they said they defeated somebody, they said they defeated them completely. And this is what Merneptah says that he did for for Israel. And then a, a few hundred years later, uh, this second thing is called the Moabite stone. This is uh, written in the Phoenician language, which is uh, a close relative to, uh, to Hebrew, but a little bit uh, different. This comes from the nation of Moab, and uh, this talks about how uh, Moab had been oppressed by the evil nation of Wait for it, Israel. Yes, Moab had been oppressed by Israel under King Omri and King Ahab. And uh, in the Moabite stone, King Misha, King Misha of Moab, he says that Chemosh, the Moabite god Chemosh, was angry with his people in Moab. And he allowed them to be overtaken by Israel. But eventually, the uh, Moabites repented to their god, Chemosh, and Chemosh turned back toward them in gracefulness. Uh, a lot of this language should, should sound familiar to, to students of the Bible, particularly in the book of Judges. We see how the people of Israel, before they, uh, before they were settled, really completely finally settled in their land, they rebelled against God, and God became angry with them and allowed them to be oppressed, and then they cried out to God for deliverance, and God sent them a deliverer, and then they had peace. Well, the same thing is happening in the Moabite stone, just from a different perspective. Next picture, we, uh, we go a little bit further on into, into history, and now the kingdoms have been divided between Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And this is a picture from, or a, an engraving from, the reign of Shalmaneser III, a, who was a king in Assyria. This is a, a scene where King Jehu is giving Shalmaneser tribute, giving, uh, essentially paying off Shalmaneser, so Shalmaneser will not send the army to destroy the nation of Israel. And as we, we look at this thing, uh, if you look at it closely, there's uh, some figures uh, on the right and some figures on the left. The figures on the right, on the extreme right, is, is the attendant for the king, Shalmaneser. And just next to him is, uh, is the king himself seated on his throne. And uh, the, uh, the fellow right about in the middle of the picture with, uh, with a long curly beard is King Jehu bringing his offerings to uh, Shalmaneser, the great king of Assyria. Uh, typically in ancient Near Eastern art, uh, Semitic people were, were presented with long curly beards uh, like this. This was, uh, this was their, their characteristic uh, way they were presented. And then we move forward again about another 150 years, and uh, we find uh, a prism called the Sennacherib prism, or Sometimes it's called the Taylor Prism. This was developed by a later king of Assyria called Sennacherib. And uh, the story is told in, uh, in 2 Kings and uh, a little bit also in the book of Isaiah, where uh, Sennacherib and the army of, of the Assyrians were attacking 
Jerusalem in the year 701 BCE, the 14th year of King Hezekiah. And Hezekiah prays for deliverance from God. And God eventually brings about a miraculous deliverance so that the, that the Assyrian army goes away and does not destroy Jerusalem at this time. But on this uh, Sennacherib prism, there's a, a wonderful little phrase here where King Sennacherib boasts that uh, he has shut up Hezekiah, king of the city of Judah, like a bird in a cage. It's a wonderful bit of uh, ancient trash talk, I guess you would call it. And uh, this next picture is uh, it's not an inscription anymore. This is not, this is not an ancient uh, thing, but this is a, a model that was, uh, that was developed in modern times of what a typical Israelite house would look like. And uh, archaeologists have, uh, have determined that when this kind of house appears, they recognize this as an Israelite-occupied site. Uh, when the characteristic of, of Israel was the four-roomed house. And uh, on, the, on the lower level, underneath the, um, underneath the two walkways on the top there, there were, uh, there were three rooms for storage and for... Uh, this is where they'd keep the animals and things like that. And uh, the upper room on the... On the second level was where the where the family would live and do their cooking and and all of these things, and it, this gives a an, an interesting um, interesting picture about uh, some some of the culture of ancient Israel. So, when when Jesus was born, we normally think that when we use the word stable, Jesus was born in a stable. We think that it was a separate building from the house out away from the farmhouse a little bit, but that's not quite the right picture. Really, where, where Jesus would have been born would have been in this, in this lower part where the animals uh, were kept and where the animals were, were fed. Because normally you, uh, people would stay, especially uh, out-of-town relatives, would stay in the main part of the house with the, with the family. But there was no room left in the main part of the house. So Jesus was born in this lower part. And also, this upper room would have been the place where, or a similar kind of place where Jesus would have met with his disciples for this, uh, uh, this event that we call the Last Supper, where they, they met in the upper room. And this last picture is a uh, another mo a model of the Jerusalem Temple under Solomon. This was a this was a great and wonderful and grand thing, but unfortunately, we don't have direct archaeological evidence of Solomon's Temple. The only thing left standing is the western wall. Perhaps there's something underneath the ground, but the political situation in Jerusalem is such now that uh, we're not able to dig there and to see exactly what's underneath the ground, what is in our past. But on analogy through, uh, through hundreds and hundreds of different temples and shrines to various gods that have been found throughout the ancient Near East, we know that the, the plan of the Jerusalem temple was how temples and shrines and worship places were built. Uh, regardless of the god, uh, to which they, or God or goddess, to which they were dedicated, these temples have three areas. They have an outer area where uh, just, uh, just about anybody can go in, but usually some restrictions. You, the Jerusalem temple, it was limited to uh, Israelite men were the only ones that could go into the outer courts of the temple. And then the second part is called the holy place. Only priests could enter into the holy place. And then way in the back uh, is the most holy place. In previous videos, we've, we've seen the temple at, at Arad and that had the, uh, the outer court and the holy place and the most holy place in there. 
and only the high priest and only on one day of the year could uh, could he go into the into the holy of holies in all of these other temples that we have from the ancient near east this is where the statue of the god or the goddess would be kept of course there was no statue of the god in israel because uh, Israelites were forbidden in the Ten Commandments to have an image of God. There were some disagreements about uh, how, uh, how we should really worship God or what God really wanted. We can see some of these in the book of Jeremiah, for example. Jeremiah and a prophet by the name of Hananiah, the Septuagint calls him a false prophet, and ultimately that's what he proved to be. Uh, Hananiah said that this was after the first exile of the Jews, he said that in two years God will bring back all of the exiles and God will bring back all of the holy objects into the temple in Jerusalem. And Jeremiah said, well, I hope you're right, but you're not right. And in another place in Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah and uh, other Judeans are in Egypt, and Jeremiah and uh, devotees of the queen of heaven, or I like to call, the, call them the queeness. They're, they're arguing about which God this should be served. And Jeremiah says, ever since you abandoned Yahweh to worship the queen of heaven and all of these other gods, that's why these tragedies have happened to you. That's why you've been taken away from your land. And the queeness, they say, well, no, actually that's not right. Ever since we abandoned the Queen of Heaven to worship Yahweh, this is why these things have happened to us. We have been subject to war and starvation and disease. They make the, they make the same argument, but in, um, in support of a different god, or in the case of the Queenus, a different goddess. And to conclude this um, video here, this is, again, this was a very, very short summary of the history and culture of ancient Israel. Uh, There's a very large topic, and I encourage you to investigate you, this more uh, as, you, as you have time and as you are able to find, uh, to find resources. Because uh, even though Israel was small, it was a very important nation in the history of the world. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.